Hey monsters, thanks for tuning in to Murder Murder News, the true crime cult for the latest breaking news, murdery memes, TV reviews, podcast recommendations, and all things spooky. Plus, baby goats. I'm Aurora. And I'm Angelina. This is the week in true crime. Murder, murder news. This week, authorities are looking for missing soldier Vanessa Guillen, who has been missing from the Fort Hood Army Post since April 22nd. Vanessa's keys to her car and room, plus her identification, were all found in the armory where she was last working. Vanessa was last seen wearing a black t-shirt in the parking lot of her barracks. A $15,000 award is being offered for any information on her whereabouts. Three transgender women were killed in the past month in Puerto Rico, adding to the epidemic of violence against the LGBTQ community. Leila Pailez, and Serena Angelique Velasquez Ramos were found burned to death in Layla's car. Penelope Diaz Ramirez was also beaten and hanged in a men's correctional facility on April 13th. This is the ninth murder of a transgender person in the U.S. alone this year. Julio Serrano, a spokesperson for the Broad Committee of the Search of Equity in Puerto Rico, is asking for the police to disclose the status of the investigations of these brutal deaths. A postal worker was shot on Monday in Indianapolis while on her mail route. Angela Summers was found after being shot in the chest on the east side of Indianapolis. When officers found her, she was alive and talking, but she died shortly after arriving at the hospital. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service is offering a reward of up to $50,000 for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons who shot and killed Angela. Each week, we'll try to introduce you to a podcast that might be new for you. This week's favorite podcast is Slay Queens. We are so excited to have Ashley and Wayne with us from this week's favorite podcast, Slay Queens. Slay Queens is dedicated to the discussion of true crimes that affect LGBTQIA community. Wayne and Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. It's just a real pleasure. Yeah, so where are y'all located and how is the quarantine where you are? I will let you feel that one, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're feeling the effects a little bit more than I am. I was gonna say, I think it'll be better for me to answer that considering he's the only one I think of like our group of friends that's still working, you know, the front lines. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, yeah, you're so welcome. You. I, you know, I'm a hairstylist and I run my own business. So I have been home for, we stopped counting at about day 37. So I'm not really even sure at this point, but it's nice, you know, my girlfriend moved here in November sooner than we had anticipated uh, from Texas. So it's great that, you know, she's here. We're officially engaged during quarantine. So mine's going okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, congratulations. That's Yay. Cool. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, that's really big news. And like, how can any of us top that? That's so cool. And y'all are from Ohio. Is that right? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. He's a uh, just in Northern Kentucky, which is basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I'm yeah. from Ohio originally. Like I've been gone for a long time, but I'm from Columbus. So it's like always so amazing when you have meet Ohioans in the wild. <laughs> like, there's so few of us. <laughs> I know. Yeah, uh, I do live in uh, the northernmost part of Kentucky. And a lot of people don't always consider that uh, Ohio and Kentucky are literally just across the river from one another. Right. Uh, at least Cincinnati, Ohio, I'm the northernmost part of Kentucky. So though my address is Kentucky, it takes me literally six minutes to get from my house to downtown Cincinnati. So I consider myself part of the Cincinnati uh, community. That's amazing. And, yeah. and all the time I lived in Ohio, I think I've been to Kentucky one time, which is shameful. <laughs> I think it was like actually when I was driving between Texas up to Ohio to visit my parents like on like a big road trip and, okay. and I was only there for like a day. So I have to get down to visit sometime. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, I consider myself a little bit of a country boy. So I appreciate the fact that I can be in Kentucky and still kind of claim those like Southern country roots, but also be part of uh, Cincinnati and Ohio because that I was actually born in Ohio. Adorable. So I get the best of both, I think. Yay, that's so cute, I yeah. love that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what inspired you all to start your podcast? Oh, it's a fun story. Should you <laughs> yes. or should I, Ashley? I think you, you should. 
I mean, you tell the story so well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be happy to. Um, Ashley and I actually became friends when she and my boyfriend, Hunter, uh, they got a part-time, they each got a part-time job together working as baristas uh, at a local coffee venue. Uh, we won't shout out any specific names uh, because <laughs> yeah. we're not sponsored by anybody, but right. uh, they started working together. If you're together. paying attention though, I'm assuming you are accepting sponsorships. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely <laughs> we are, yes. Um, but they became uh, really close really quickly. And uh, so then we all started spending time together, obviously, because you know, your, your uh, partners spend time with your friends and whatnot. And uh, Ashley and I, uh, just in kind of basic conversation, realized that we had uh, in common this true crime obsession. So yes. we started having those conversations. Uh, most of the time we subjected our poor uh, partners uh, to listening to these conversations take place. But, it's the traditional true crime like conversation that you have with that like kindred spirit. You're like, oh my goodness, what do you think of this? Who's your favorite this? Uh, how did you feel about this? What's the thing that freaked you out the most? And uh, apparently even the non-true crime fans that our spouses are uh, found <laughs> it interesting enough that they said, you know what, you guys should do a podcast together. And uh, I kind of said, you know, that would be great, but there are so many true crime podcasts out there. Right. If we did something, I'd really want us to do something that was kind of special, something that maybe not anyone else is doing right now. And uh, fast forward, I don't know, what was it, Ashley, just a few weeks maybe? Yeah, or, a couple yeah, weeks. Something along those lines. Uh, I got up early one morning, and I don't know about other people who have a long commute to work, but what I'm doing when I'm walking around zombie-like in the house is I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to listen to that morning on my way to work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I thought about uh, one of my favorite podcasts and how they had done a few like LGBTQ episodes. And I thought, man, it would be so great if somebody just did all LGBTQ episodes, LGBTQIA episodes. And uh, I did a quick little search on my phone. And at least at the time, nobody else was doing that primarily. So I texted Ashley. Ashley, do you remember what it was that I said? <laughs> he said, I had an epiphany. And it was, the best part <laughs> is, the best part is it was to his boyfriend and myself in a group chat and it was about 5:30 right. in the morning 5:30 5, 6 o'clock in the morning and uh and it says you know we, we shall host a true crime podcast about the lgbtqia plus community and it shall be called slay queens and that's exactly how i read it in my head and i was like <laughs> yes it's the best name you really did have an early morning epiphany that's fantastic yeah, <laughs> yeah was that awesome. was on no caffeine so i mean <laughs> even more impressive exactly uh -huh, right. thank you thank you for that <laughs> Um, so what got you into true crime? Was there a hometown murder, um, something like big, an event, a TV show? What got you into it? You jump on that one, Ashley. Um, so it's funny, because I was thinking about that, honestly, just a few days ago. Like, how did I come? Because I, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've been kind of intrigued by true crime. And realistically, if I had to think about it, it would probably be John Benet Ramsey. Like I was a kid, I was probably eight, nine years old, 10 years old in the grocery store looking at tabloids, like this beautiful little girl on the cover. I'm like, what is this story? What's going on? And I was just so enthralled by it at such a young age, you know, watching the news when I wasn't supposed to be, you know, behind my mom, just being obsessed with this case. Like what happened to this girl? Like not even realizing that there was a murder that had happened. I just knew that she was missing kind of thing. So I think that's, that was the big case for me. <laughs> That's great. And how about you, Wayne? I actually, um, as far back as I can remember, I think where kind of my little true crime obsession started was my mother and my stepfather at the time were big fans of the show Unsolved Mysteries. And yes! They used to watch the show <laughs> weekly, and though it was one of those things that my mom never encouraged me to watch with her, I would sneak kind of like around uh, in the corner of the room and just watch episodes with them. And I just really, really grew to love kind of that like mystery element. I mean, I know that sounds a little cheesy, uh, but that mystery element that it just kind of gets my brain going and makes me wonder what happened, you know, what are the possibilities? Um, and then later we spent a little bit of time when I was a teenager living in Tupelo, Mississippi, huge culture shock from a kid who came from Ohio, but that's a whole other set of stories. <laughs> uh, but we did spend a little bit of time in Tupelo, Mississippi, 
and I befriended a group of people who had had a friend just a couple of years before I moved to the area disappear, a 13 year old girl whose name was Lee Ochi disappeared under very, very uh, mysterious circumstances. Blood was in the home, that sort of thing. And uh, to this very day, nobody knows what happened to the poor girl, nobody knows her whereabouts. And I just remember sitting around with my friends talking about her and seeing how that loss of a friend and how the unanswered questions just affected them so profoundly. It just boggled my mind then and it boggles my mind to this very day. So I think maybe a combination of those things are why I'm such a true crime fan. It's so fascinating to me how many people come up missing and are never found. It's like we live in such right. a world and you think there's so many people paying attention and it, it feels like we're constantly being watched, like not a conspiracy theory sort of thing, but it feels like somebody should always be paying attention. And mm -hmm. I was reading recently that I think in the U.S. alone, 400,000 people a year come up missing. Wow. Most of them are found, um, but like okay. 400,000 missing person cases. And it, it's a pretty high number that are never found or they're found dead, unfortunately. Like it's just yeah. so shocking to me and 13 so young. <laughs> yeah, she, and she was a really beautiful girl and she made a yeah. huge impact on the life of, of my friends who of course I didn't know her, but I knew them thereafter. And uh, there have been some podcasts who have covered her story and there's some other like literature out there that you can read and it's, it's just so tragic. And many, many years later, I mean, this was in the 90s, many years later, they still have as many questions as they had on the day that she went missing. And something about that to me is, is first and foremost, just completely tragic. But like you said, it's, it's so intriguing. Like how can someone just disappear with no answers without a trace? And that's, you know, part of why I like to delve into these stories, just yeah. uh, kind of, boggle my mind a little bit more. <laughs> right. Yeah. And are there any current cases right now, any big cases in the media that you're both following? I think we have a couple, honestly, that both of us uh, have been following. Um, completely slipping my mind though right now, Wayne, do you want to help me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's um, a couple. <laughs> there was one, it was actually a missing, per missing persons case that ended kind of tragically. Uh, it was local to our area and funny enough, it, it kind of splits the difference between Ashley and I where the young lady, her yes. name was Paige Johnson. Yes, she yes, yes. was from the Northern Kentucky area, went missing from here and unfortunately uh, 10 years, 10 years after she had gone missing, her remains were found uh, in Ohio mm -hmm. uh, in a state park area. And uh, we've been kind of following that recently. We did a little bit of a chat about it with another uh, host of another podcast uh, just kind of having a, a, a bit of a Zoom date uh, like this. And uh, we've been following that one uh, a good bit. Her name is Paige Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, there yeah. are a couple that maybe aren't as current uh, in the media, but there are some that I always kind of check up on and pay attention to. Yes. I'm, I'm a big fan of missing persons cases as well because, um, well, because there's so many unanswered questions. So uh, like Bryce Las Pisa, uh, he's kind of uh, equated to be the male Mara Murray because he's gone missing under very similar circumstances. There's been no trace of him. Um, and then since you are local to Columbus, do you know the case of Brian Schaefer? I don't. He's, yeah, he was a college student. Um, I think he was pre-med college student who literally there was video footage of him going into a college bar and he never came out again and has vanished off of the face of the planet. And again, no. I've been using this term a lot, but it blows my mind, it boggles my mind that someone can just disappear without a trace. So I always check up on those cases. I especially love those cases. I yeah. think it, it's interesting seeing how true crime has developed, like since we were kids, where there weren't cameras and phones and like ways of tracking people. Yeah. Now when there's a missing person and it's like we have their Google Maps, we have videos of them like going into or coming out of a bar or in an alleyway. Yeah. And it's like, where did the camera footage stop? Like, <laughs> what, did it stop? what happened? Yes, uh, we need answers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, we want to make sure that our watchers know where they can find you. So where can they find you on social media? Oh, Ashley, you're so good at this. Oh, it's my thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely social is. Media, we have Twitter, Instagram. We do have a Patreon account as well. Um, our Facebook account is newer, but we do have that also. And then um, 
no, at gmail.com, slavequeenspod at gmail. If you just have something you want to write in or say, you know, that's helpful too. All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining us and be sure to subscribe to Slay Queens wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. This week, we're watching Waco on Netflix. Waco tells the story of the 1993 standoff between the Branch Davidians against the FBI and ATF in Waco, Texas. The show is based on the books A Place Called Waco, A Survivor's Story, and Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator. If you're unfamiliar with the story of David Koresh and his followers, this is the show for you. The show mostly focuses on the perspective of the Branch Davidians, since David Thibodeau, one of the survivors of Waco, wrote the book the show is based on and was also a writer for this show. Be sure to check it out and let us know how you felt about the FBI's reaction to the cult in the comments below. Have you been able to watch this yet? I haven't watched this yet. I've seen a couple of things about Waco before, um, so I'm not sure if there's going to be a lot of new info for me, but it's always interesting to see another perspective there. It's really good, and I kind of haven't had the bandwidth for a lot of TV lately, and mm -hmm. especially true crime mm -hmm. stuff, which is usually totally my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but like because it's sort of like a... Um, like a dramatization it's not actually a documentary right I was really feeling it like my husband and I watched the entire thing last weekend nice. and I don't know that much about the cult like I've never read anything about it I've never listened to a podcast about it and I feel like they definitely give David Koresh a whole lot more credit than he is owed in this I don't Ooh, know if anybody else felt that way like <laughs> they make it sound like he's definitely not the bad guy wow well that's <laughs> definitely an interesting take I'm not sure how, how I feel about that one but <laughs> yeah like I, I know that after watching it I felt like the FBI is definitely very must at fault for the fire most likely and for as many deaths that occurred from it mm -hmm. like it was pretty shocking but I'm pretty sure David Crush had more to do with it than the show makes it out <laughs> yeah yeah I think you're probably right by the sounds of things <laughs> Today launches the May book club selection for the monster book club, The Sundown Motel. I tend to find myself reading a lot of nonfiction about true crime, but I personally have been getting a little bit too much reality lately and thought some crime fiction might be a good way to mix it up. The Sundown Motel was written by a murderino, four murderinos, and it is the Nancy Drew slash Veronica Mars story of murder and ghosts that you need to get through this trying time. In 1982, Viv Delaney goes missing while working as a night clerk at the Sundown Motel in upstate New York. 35 years later, her niece Carly finds herself in search of answers to the mystery that has long haunted her family. This book has ghosts, private detectives, missing persons, and unsolved murders for you to solve right along with Carly. Our Monster Book Club will be discussing the Sundown Motel all month long, and we'll even have a Zoom call at the end of the month to have a live discussion. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to check out murdermurder.news for all the details. I am so excited about this book. Actually, I just downloaded it today, and I've heard so many good things from a lot of different friends, so I'm really hyped for this, uh, mostly because uh, it has some uh, common themes with a lot of my favorites uh, in like crime fiction, one being like the motel theme, another one being like the 80s like retro flashback sort of theme, so like yes. I'm really, really looking forward to this one. You're so right, and I'm hoping at some point they make this into a TV show or a movie because I need that 80s hair. Yeah. And like when she's describing uh, like Viv in the flashback, yeah. she's talking about like putting on her like blue and purple eyeshadow, and I'm here for all of it. Yeah, I can't get enough <laughs> of that in TV shows either, so I'd love to see that too. Yes. <laughs> so we really appreciate your feedback. And this week, Steph Pans commented on our segment on the man arrested in Florida last week that as someone based outside of the US, she only ever sees stories from Florida or stories about Trump, and she suggests that maybe there's something in the Florida water. Thanks to Paula Gross for her comment mentioning that she likes to listen to our stories as she walks because it makes her walks go so fast. The only motivation I ever have to work out is being afraid I'm gonna be attacked at some point, so I totally get you. Thanks so much for tuning into This Week in True Crime with Murder Murder News. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button below, give us a thumbs up, and tell all of your true crime friends. If you need more of a true crime fix, join our commune at murdermurder.news for our monster book club and cold case solving groups. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. See you next week.